Hey, so I want to talk about what it means to integrate generative AI into your application development process. And I've got some really cool hands-on demos that I'm going to show you today, going from our local development environment, where we'll be working with some models from Hugging Face, inferencing them locally in our inner loop development process, but also talking and showing how to take that model, deploy it onto a Kubernetes environment where we're actually working with our applications in production and what it means and best practices in order to deploy those applications over there as well. So my name is Cedric Clyburn. I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. And without further ado, I kind of want to level set what it means to build applications with generative AI. And specifically, I'm talking about the building, the running, and deploying of these apps that it is such are intelligent applications that can take advantage of a model that we have deployed somewhere. And what this model can do for us is really amazing. You've probably already worked with models like ChatGPT or Llama that are able to work with large amounts of data in order to work with reviews or surveys and extract key details, or maybe perform SQL queries from natural language into our database, or be able to determine whether a user is happy or upset, or object detect photos or video, and the use cases go on. And this is in addition to just commercial uses and, and regular uses of AI for working with ChatGPT or, or Llama, if you've used those before, and, and being able to use code generation tools like GitHub Copilot and Kodi, which are fantastic. But I want to kind of talk about how in the enterprise and business use case, over 80% of enterprises are going to have some type of generative AI infused in their applications by 2026. And this is super exciting. And I want to break down what it means for an application developer to start adopting generative AI. Now, there's a lot of things that we're going to cover in today's session, but I want mainly specifically want to talk about these three. Firstly, the ideation and prototyping of working with LLMs and finding them from repositories such as Hugging Face, which we'll be doing today, to try out different prompts and experiment with the data that we have and figure out what kind of model specifically we'd like to have, large or small. Is it a chat or is it an instruct model? Is it for a specific use case? Maybe it's text to image or working with audio or just a regular chat interface. On Hugging Face is quite the collection of over half a million different open source models that we can start using essentially today. And we're going to talk about how to uh, figure out which is right for your specific use case, so how to evaluate these models, but also the building and refining uh, phase of where we're actually taking a model and invoking and inferencing it in order to build an intelligent application that we can deploy somewhere. So this is talking kind of about connecting to data sources and working with RAG, perhaps to have the context for our specific organization but also evaluating flows and, and figuring out how to effectively build and connect to a, a model, which also brings us into operationalizing the generative AI. How do we serve the model? Where do we serve the model? And how do we connect to the endpoints? Do we need authorization, some kind of token? How do we monitor not only the model itself that's being served, but also the application that's uh, being able to connect to the model? Uh, and how do we integrate those with the applications that we're Oh, we already have and new applications that we want to build to take advantage of generative AI. Um, so it is quite a lot, uh, but no need to fret because what we've kind of learned in the past year is that the barrier to entry has really gone down for developers adding Gen AI to their applications. This slash data report shows that most developers are kind of accessing these AI models in third party services, just working with APIs that we're already familiar with, right? So this could be ChatGPT's API or, or Gemini, just being able to work with Langchain, provide a bear token, and start working with prompt and prompt templates from there. Now, what's great is that since AI ML expertise isn't that much of a significant factor for using these models, that we're able to get more hands-on and build applications faster and bring them into production much quicker. But these APIs are costly, right? These aren't free. We're having to pay for the tokens that we're using, subscription fees, whatever it might be, open API, open AI's pricing is here for the amount of tokens that we're using. But there's also subscription fees as well as hidden costs like troubleshooting and false positives in addition to initial costs, which might be low when you initially start working with the project. But once we actually take an application into production and tons of users start working with it, then we can see those costs essentially exponentially creep. And that kind of brings us to the point of it's great to essentially enable developers to use these models. But thanks to a lot of new technologies in the open source world now, such as Llama C++ and, and frameworks that work on top of it, like Olama, 
we're able to quickly set up provision and start working with generative AI on our local environments much faster now. And this allows us to essentially take a model, say from Hugging Face, to essentially start up a model server, say with Llama C++, and package that into a container the same way that we do with our application and its dependencies, but now with the model, be able to scale and, and increase the portability of that, uh, that model, just like we do with our applications, and use it locally. Now, why would you want to run a model locally? Well, there's plenty of reasons, but it mainly comes down to customization and control. The convenience of being able to set up a model locally for debugging and development in an inner loop is really, really powerful, not having to worry about the authentication and the way we connect to our model and not even needing internet connection to be able to work with the LLM is super powerful for developers. But also there's a, a really big factor in the ownership of data that we have for how we process and work with our data for LLMs and kind of the, the black box that we hear about when putting in our data. We've, you've kind of heard a lot of stories from companies out there who have been using you know, models like ChatGPT that are continually training and, and might have put in source code that's proprietary and then seen that somewhere else on the internet. So we want to be able to maintain control of our data. And for developers that are just getting started with Gen AI, having a place to, to learn best practices, but also start from the local development environment is so powerful and serves as a great starting point, right? And so without further ado, I want to show this actual process that I've been talking about of being able to start a model server locally on my machine. And this is thanks to a really cool tool that's called Podman Desktop. Now, you might have heard of this before. It's based on the Podman container engine, which similar to Docker allows us to work with containers. But Podman has a lot of Kubernetes features in order to work with Kubernetes pods, but also deploy to Kubernetes context with Podman Desktop. So it's a great tool. It's an open source project. You can check it out here. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and open it up here in my machine. Now I'm working with the latest version here. You can see that I can create images for my for my applications and run those as containers here and work with pods as well, which is really neat. You can see one of these running already. And there's also functionality for Kubernetes if I'm connected to my kubeconfig for a Kubernetes cluster. But this AI lab is really what I want to show you. Now, all I had to do to install this was just head to the catalog and install Podman AI lab here. And here is kind of the starting point for an application developer to work with LLMs from not only a catalog of these curated models that we have here from Hugging Face, but also to import them as GGUF files directly from Hugging Face as well. Now, I want to kind of talk to you about the recipes. Now, I was talking earlier before about what it means for a new developer to start working with Gen AI and how it, there's kind of a barrier to entry, but it's been lessened by tools like this that allow us to, as I see, show you here on the right, create a serving, an inference server for a model, say, for example, this Granite model that we have downloaded already, but also to containerize our application that's going to be assisted by that model as well. So I'm going to go ahead and restart this here so you can see the process. And we're using the Granite model here, but we can switch out from different models here that are compatible with our application that we're working with. So if we want to use Hermes or Mistral or Merlinite, we can check those out and kind of see how the performance depends and varies based on what model we're using. Now down here, we can open up this application in VS Code. I'm going to show you what it looks like right before we go ahead and open it up in the web browser. But it's essentially this app folder here that contains a summarizer.py connecting to our model endpoint that we have being served and essentially chunking the text from a PDF that we're reading in to use a prompt template here that I customized to add in some cool accreditation and make me sound cooler when I give it my bio. And we're essentially going to read the file, chunk the text, and process that so that we can have an aggregated summary. So let's go ahead and see this in action. We have this running in a pod right here. So I'll open this up in my browser. And here we can see we have a really simple Streamlit application. I'm going to give it my bio here that I have on my website. And uh, what's really cool is I don't have LangChain installed on my machine, but because we were putting this inside of a container, using the Red Hat UBI, Universal Base Image for Python, to do a streamlit run for this file here. It doesn't matter because those dependencies are already downloaded in the container image. And so here, of course, I told it to give me extra accreditation. It says I'm a highly acclaimed software technologist. Okay, I appreciate it, AI. And I've made significant contributions to the open source community. Well, I'm happy that it says that. It's partially true, but it's a cool summary nonetheless. And so this is just a really simple example of working with 
a containerized application and the model server also containerized. I'm going to show you how that works here in a second. But if we click on this pod here, we can see the logs, of course, for the server for the model, but also the Streamlit application that we have running as a container as well. So we can see that here in the pod section. So I'll come back over here and show you how this works from a technology stack background. But also I can show you that if we want to run a specific model as a service and connect to it and be able to essentially have some boilerplate code to work with this model, we can do that here from the services section. Say I'm working with Java and I want to be able to use, let's say, Langchain for J. I can have all the information here to add to my application properties, to add to the palm.xml, and create a service that will be able to use the model that I have being served. And so this is a great way to get started and see our model server container running as well. Now I can also create a playground. And so what I'll go ahead and do is show you uh, an example model. And this is going to be specifically Nistral. This is a pretty popular a mixture of experts model. And I, I have a quick story that I'll go ahead and show you here on the slides. Now, let me, let me get to it here in a second. This is Pod and AI Lab, as you've just seen. How it's working is we have a model runtime, which is Llama C++. Don't worry, you don't, you don't have to worry about it because it's containerized and the model is mounted to it so that we can use playground environments to ask it questions or just be able to serve the model and connect to it. Um, now, the model server and the AI application are both containerized. Uh, of course, it's open source, so we could use whatever type of stack we want. We were using a Streamlit application. If we're working with RAG, we can be working with a vector database. But I want to talk about fine-tuning an LLM because I was just in Vegas this past weekend. And while I didn't win anything, I kind of started to think about, you know, what is the largest Las Vegas jackpot that has ever been won? So naturally, I went over to uh, my favorite AI model, and I asked it the question, you know, what was the biggest... Vegas jackpot. And so I can adjust the parameters here in the playground environment. So I'll make it definite and limit it to 100 tokens here. And I'll ask it, so what was the biggest Vegas jackpot? And so the response that we get is that it's held by Elmer Sherwin for $21 million at the Horseshoe Casino in 1989. And that's great. You know, he's probably pretty happy about it. But I was actually a little curious if that is true. I looked it up, though. It is not true. The largest was almost $40 million in 2003. And this is a common issue that we have with these types of models, right? They've been trained on so much data so that they're good at doing a little bit of everything. But if we ask a specific question for our use case, we won't always get the right answer. And the model might hallucinate a little bit. So what I've actually gone ahead and done is worked with a project, and it's called Instruct Lab. So this open source project that was created by Red Hat and IBM from a research paper allows us to essentially contribute information skills to a model, for example, and be able to kind of make AI truly open with uh, being able to uh, put new data in and contribute upstream so that we don't have a lot of forks that are just uh, essentially forked and, and nothing comes of it, right? We can contribute back to open source models just like we do with open source projects through these skills and recipes in a taxonomy model uh, that are trained locally on my machine, even though I don't have, you know, tons of GPUs um, or tons of time. I can do this in just a few hours to add new synthetic data. And I've actually done this here in the terminal. So let me open this up and show you that I use the iLab CLI in order to serve one of the models. This is Merlinite, a derivative of Mixtral. Uh, and what I did is added some information about uh, some of the biggest... Um, winners of Vegas jackpots. So let me go to VS Code and I'll open up the other project, which is Taxonomy. Uh, and so here I've added in a YAML file. I'm a developer. I don't know data science, but I do know YAML uh, formatting. So I've added in some information about when it was won, about the occupation and the winner. He was a software engineer from Los Angeles. That's pretty cool. And I've made this open source. So the information is in a markdown file for more information there and attributed it. So all I had to do was go back over to the terminal and uh, make sure that the formatting was valid and then hit an iLab generate, which is actually going to create synthetic training data, just like how the training process works for large language models in order to ask it a lot of questions here that you can kind of see as we progress down in natural language. So in question and answer format, it's like, what would this, what was, what, what was this jackpot one on? Can you tell me more about the game? And we're going to kind of be giving question and answer formats in order to train this model with more data that it didn't know initially with its training data set. 
And so you can see here that the, the training process kind of finished up. And all I had to do was essentially merge that information into the Merlinite model and convert it into a GDUF file that I have here. And I want to show you on Podman Desktop's AI lab. So I'll create a new playground. And this is going to be using this train model in GGUF format that I've imported. And what I'm going to do is essentially give it the same question, right? Where and when was the largest Vegas jackpot? And I can mess with the parameters again. So 100 max tokens, make sure the answer is very definitive. And we're going to ask this trained model that I've trained directly on my laptop here without a GPU in the span of just an hour or two that the Vegas slot machine payout was at the Excalibur. That's correct. And it was $39 million. And that is completely correct. That's the new information that I've given in this taxonomy repository and use this Instruct Lab CLI in order to train this model, convert it, that I can share it now with its GGUF format on Hugging Face for others to use. And you'll notice that there's no rag that's going on. This is the default model that I've essentially trained on my, my laptop here with synthetic training data and I'm now able to share. And this is a great way when you can think about all the business use cases, but it's such a great way to be able to retrain data with specific information and training data for my organization or my specific use case. So it's a great way to be able to play around here with these playground environments. But what I want to kind of go ahead and show you is coming back to the slides, it's great to be able to work with these models locally on our machine, build these uh, AI enabled applications. I want to talk a little bit about what it means to move to a production environment because from our development environment, it's great to work with models locally, but it's a little bit more complex when we're working in a Kubernetes environment and, and moving these models to production. We have to think about more things. For, for example, being able to collect data from a variety of different sources, maybe Kafka for streaming in that data to a repository for, for example, our data scientists to be able to experiment and create or expand new models to then be integrated into app development processes like what I just did with pipelines and GitOps to be powering these AI-enabled applications that essentially inference the model that we have, for example, the one I just trained or another one that our data scientists have came up with, and then being able to monitor that. And we need a pretty big stack in order to be able to do that, right? We need the machine learning libraries to work with and create new models for example, LangChain I just showed before, we need environments for our data scientists to work in, for example, Jupyter, but also our developers to work with, like VS Code. We need tools in order to work with data visualization and, and label and processing like Spark and Airflow and Ray, but also to create automation for fine tuning, for example, with using Kubeflow or MLflow or experimentation and also KSERV for model serving. But then we also have some of the tools that we've already worked with like Linux for running Linux containers, which is what we did for the model inference server and also our containerized application with maybe hardware acceleration. And we containerize that with Docker or for example, Podman. And with those containerized applications, we would take them to an orchestrator like Kubernetes. We also have to think about operating containers at scale, how we can monitor them with Prometheus and Grafana, but also automate the delivery of models and our AI enabled applications with Argo and Tekton. We also have to think about if we have a model, where are we going to store it, right? Maybe it's a Minio bucket, maybe it's somewhere else. And how are we going to handle the traffic in between our applications with Istio uh, and a variety of other tools? So it's a large stack, not only for the AI and MLOps portion, but also for the application platform that we need to run our models uh, and AI-enabled applications on. And what we've done here at Red Hat is kind of uh, collected a assortment of these open source projects for working with data science and AI and ML and kind of put this into a community project that's known as Open Data Hub. So all the tools that we're familiar with and that are uh, industry-wide adopted for working with these models and serving them, uh, we've taken them and put them into a distribution, kind of like what we've done for OpenShift uh, from Kubernetes made it enterprise grade, but we've also productized it for support with OpenShift AI. Uh, and what this allows you to do is essentially complete the entire model lifecycle going from model development, working with Jupyter Lab and all these libraries, to serving and monitoring that model, to being able to collaborate with all the different personas in our organization. So with that being said, I'll head back over to OpenShift AI to show you what it means to bring over a model into production. And I've got a really cool example that I'd like to show you. So here we are in the OpenShift AI dashboard. And a lot of the tools and technologies that I just talked about in the stack for open source AI development 
and deployment on Kubernetes can be seen here as well. For example, being able to work with Jupyter Hub environments for a variety of different notebook images, for example, CUDA, PyTorch, and TensorFlow for our data scientists to be able to run experiments and develop models on, as well as pipelines with Kubeflow in order to automate perhaps some of the fine tuning of our models, as well as model serving. When we have a model that we'd like to serve, we can within the cluster or outside with authorization. And so if we check this model, we can see that it is alive and working under a REST protocol. We can also check out cluster storage internally, but also data connections for S3 buckets that we might be connected to and permissions for our users to collaborate. But I want to show you inside of this workbench what we're working with. Now, let's go into the perspective of a data scientist who might be on our team. And we're going to work with a new model now. It's a little bit cooler. This is the stable diffusion model that we're going to be working with that's directly from Hugging Face here that allows us to generate photos based on a prompt. Now, you might have worked with some kind of model like this before. And what I've gone ahead and done is loaded in the dependencies here in these cells that essentially just run Python code. And I'm going to ask this Stability AI Stable Diffusion model, well, let's generate a photo of a dog. Now, what we're going to end up doing is generating photos of Red Hat Teddy, as we see here in the bottom left. It's a big Red Hat fan. And we're going to be able to put him anywhere that we can think of. So firstly, let's go ahead and just ask what uh, a photo of a dog would look like. It is a nice dog, but it's not the dog that we want to generate. So what we're going to go ahead and do is generate a photo of Red Hat Teddy or try to ask this model what it thinks a Red Hat Teddy dog looks like. But since it hasn't been trained, we're going to go through some training and fine tuning processes in the next notebook. And this is kind of the activities that a data scientist would do, right? Start from a base foundation model, train it in the specific use case that we like, um, and have a final product for our developers to use. So I've gone ahead and I'll go ahead and run through this so you can see what happened. But we've installed the requirements we needed and we've set up some options for training. This includes some of the training data that we have, which is different photos of Teddy and a variety of different places. We'll take a look at that here in a second. But we also have some variables for what we'd like to name, the model, the one that we're using. And I'll go ahead and open up these photos so you can see. But we kicked off the job, which is a dream booth type of training technique enabling us to teach this diffusion model new objects and information without it forgetting what it knows. So this is Teddy. He's a great dog, a good boy. We've kicked off the training job here. And after about 20 minutes that I've kind of sped through here, we have an output for generated model weights that we've saved in S3 bucket. And now we have that stored in our local Minio storage on the cluster so that we're able to do remote inferencing once we've served this with KServe model mesh just by deploying a model, which is pretty neat inside of our cluster. And what that actually does is I go ahead and run these cells in order to request a photo of Red Hat Teddy in the Snowy Mountains, is it's keeping the, the model essentially inside of a container and scaling that up for more usage that we need or scaling it down when it's not being used and handling that for us. So we're gonna make this request to the endpoint that we've taken from KServe here in OpenShift AI. And we're going to ask for this nice photo of Red Hat Teddy, the dog in the Snowy Mountains. It looks great. It looks fantastic. And what we could have also done is if I go over to VS Code, we could have just taken essentially this application that we have as a front end, plugged in this REST URL mm -hmm. and, and just deployed this to the cluster. But what I want to show you essentially is that because of all those best practices and the stack that we want to use when we're deploying AI models and their intelligent enabled applications to a Kubernetes cluster, well, we want to be able to think about tools like Tecton and Argo and whatever security best practices we have, all while uh, allowing our developers to be able to code and focus on uh, what they need to do as well. So I'll come back over here and I wanna show you the deployment of the application with something called Developer Hub based on the Backstage project. So what this allows us to do is not only view the services inside of our cluster and APIs that we can connect to. For example, this photo generator API that we have modeled from that KServe model back here in OpenShift AI. But we can create a new application based on that essentially base code that we have. So I just showed it to you in VS Code. Here it is as well in GitHub. And we have a template that kind of defines uh, the creation of a new uh, repository and GitOps repository for our application as well as publishing Argo CD manifest so that we can keep it up to date and creating a pipeline in order to build the, the example application into a container 
and deploy that on our Kubernetes cluster with all the best practices of our organization. So I'll go ahead and open this up. We don't have to worry about a description. We've got the cluster ID and the connection to our model that's being served. And I'll call this Teddy demo. And we'll go ahead and assign myself as the owner. And what this is going to go ahead and do is build our container image from that source code that I showed you and deploy that onto the cluster with all the guidance and golden path essentially of our organization. And so I, as a developer, don't have to worry about creating a Kubernetes deployment or worrying about GitOps or Tecton or pipelines or anything like that. I get to focus on my code, which is amazing. So back in OpenShift, I'll go ahead and take a look at this deployed application that's already been created, where I can now see that we have a new deployment in a pod with this Teddy application. We can see it has connection to the, the, the model service that's being deployed and exposed in order to inference it. And back in uh, Developer Hub, I can also open this component, view a lot of the different plugins that comes with Backstage and Developer Hub in order to view any issues for the repository or CI and CD Kubernetes objects once this image has been created and written to the internal registry. And it's a really great way for me as a developer to see everything in one place when I'm working with this generative AI enabled application. So the last thing I have to do is just go back over to where the actual workload is. So this pod that has our Flask application in it. And I'll go ahead and give it a prompt. Let's say in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. I was just there for a conference. So I was going to say Vegas, but let's give him a new place to go to. And we've gone through the process of working with the local model on my machine, training it, fine tuning it, but also uh, working with a model on Jupyter Hub for a data scientist perspective, fine tuning that and deploying that there. And how you can go back and forth between local development environments and a production Kubernetes cluster in order to deploy these generative AI enabled applications with a fully open source stack. So this is Teddy. Teddy's in front of the Golden Gate Bridge and he's happy. And I hope you are too. So thank you so much for uh, tuning in. My name is Cedric Clyburn, and I'll point to some last resources here for Podman AI Lab in order to start your generative AI local development environment on your uh, local system. And feel free to reach out. So thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.